So we are here again, Sunday 19th is, or 20th, or what, or what are we today, of, of, of May. And no, I think 19th of May 2019, we are the integral chat. And today I thought we'd talk about the quadrants and the lower right quadrants and what has it to do with us. And I think we in Europe, at least, we have an election coming up very soon. And there are some complications <laughs> in Europe, as you might have heard. Uh, we have Brexit and we have a problem in Austria. So um, I think this could be a starting point uh, when we talk about the lower white. But before we do that, uh, we do a short introduction. Ryan, you, will you always take the time for when we are too long? Okay. Uh, I'm Heidi Hörnlein, I'm in Italy and uh, it's raining. It's the 20th of May, I think, as I said. And the first uh, nests of swallows, the first, how do you say, the first uh, births of the swallows, they are all dead because it's too cold and the uh, birds didn't find enough uh, food. So if somebody says climate change is not real, I'm not so sure <laughs> about that. So, and yeah, so far to me, and I'm really interested in the lower right quadrant because I always have a sort of, you know, I'm very familiar with the upper left, but lower right, mm. so far me. Hi, I'm Kate and I'm in Massachusetts. And um, yes, lower right, I, in, in regard to the environment, everybody around here is talking about where's the black flies, which is really a weird thing to be saying because everyone hates the black flies because they bite and you know, leave, <laughs> they're really intense when they bite you. But people are, it's really late for the black flies and it's kind of weird, you know, so the system. So it's, uh, my name is Kinga and I live in Barcelona at the moment. I'm living in the hills here and I'm just looking at, at a really nice green scene, uh, which won't last for very long because I'm about to move to Austria uh, on June the 30th. But this weekend, it's funny, we're talking about animals. I'm dog sitting for my friend and this is Brandel here <laughs> next to me, who's just lovely, uh, which kind of, I guess, relates to lower right quadrants in that the friendship systems that we have and the way we physically support each other. A friend of mine is in um, Natalia. Uh, Brando's mum is in Germany for a wedding this weekend. And I've got the care of Brando, which uh, has made my housemates in my house quite unhappy um, because they're not dog friendly. So that's affecting my house uh, belonging system. I live in a share house. So it's been kind of a stressful weekend. Um, yeah. Of friendship obligations on the one hand and, and that system and clashing with my home system and yeah, moving and it's all on, it's all on. Mm. But happy to be here. Well, uh, hello. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have much to say right now, but uh, uh, I, for the uh, two minutes, I'm going to ring the Zen alarm clock bell. <laughs> so just <clears throat> letting people know kind of my, you know, the 30 second warning and then uh, I'll ring the bell. So we'll see, we'll see what comes of this discussion. Uh, I'm Paul, I'm in England. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this discussion. I feel like I sort of, um, kind of grok the lower right and kind of a little bit confused um in some ways like i i sort of think oh is this is this lower right or is it or am i sort of confusing uh, quadrants um but i think when i've used like some lower right stuff especially in my work like it's been some of the most sort of fun and powerful uh stuff i've used i think maybe because it might be like um a sort of quadrant blind spot I don't usually use it that much. So when I do, it tends to be pretty, um, uh, yeah, powerful. So, um, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. 
Thank you. You are naming it, Paul. Sometimes we get confused. I get confused and I don't really know. Is it now, which quadrant is it? And so it is sort of um, an exercise also to decide uh, what, in what quadrants we are locating what we are talking about. And sometimes it seems that at the same time they are in different quadrants, the things. Depends how we look at that. Uh, I found now interesting, uh, Kinga, that you talk about the family system and about the house system, you know, where you're living in. I had never thought about that. I always thought it's organizations, you know, and governments and things like that. <laughs> but you are right. It's, it's systems in all, in all um, aspects. And then the family system has an impact on, on you, on your system as a as a as a person which then we call upper left no but <laughs> it can be confusing yeah okay who wants to start and share something um i think on the back of what you were saying Heidi, like i sometimes think of the the lower right is this kind of like dry like political governments or something like this. And then I sort of think about it more like, um, I was just thinking about the, the chakra system, which is like one I, I really quite like. And I associate that with like upper left because most of my experience of it is kind of um, tinted that way when it probably is, um, I don't know, I guess, is it a lower right? I kind of think of it because anything I think of a system kind of tends to be, but as well, like, some of the most profound experiences I've had in lower right, it's almost like, I don't know, like kind of scientific mysticism, like looking at the, as Ken would say, the great chain of being kind of thing, like looking at like galaxies or nature or the human body and seeing like how complex it is. And it's sort of, um, I don't know, I guess like it's a more exciting experience of the lower right than, than my initial thoughts, which tends to be like more kind of dry and sort of, uh, maybe because governments and, and this kind of stuff I tend to think is not having the lower left or upper left even though it does but it's sort of um, I guess I just find it really interesting when the lower right or any of these quadrants are put in like context like seeing the way that they interact with the uh, with the other quadrants sort of seems more exciting to me that's interesting. I respond to you, Paul, because you said experiencing and I'm asking, yes, um, the, you say the chakra system is a system, but when you are experiencing a system that you do probably on the, on the upper left, while the system itself is down there. So it's sort of the same thing at the, at the same time. Okay. I kind of disagree about the chakra system because I think uh, uh, the lower right is objective that you can actually see things you can actually see. I mean, I guess people could see the chakra system if you can see auras and all that, but it, the chakra system seems to be an interior experience and maybe in the upper right to me, some kind of lines. Um, but, you know, if we're gonna go with the subjective and objective, then the objective is stuff we can see or measure, you know, to get kind of technical here. If I might just jump in, I was thinking the chakra system being more um, uh, on the, sorry, upper right, being individual physical, uh, because there might be, you know, there's subtle energies of the body. And I think there's, there's maybe limits to the uh, scientific instrumentation we've come up with in order to measure these. And like you said, um, Kate, that, yeah, maybe some people can see it. So there seems to be some kind of, um, subtle energy going on there that that is objective to some degree but maybe our scientific instruments today haven't yet come to measure it Paul could you tell us a bit more how you feel that to be lower right rather than upper right how, how that would in your mind be more of an a collective system um, objectively rather than an individual one which like my body is you know possesses these energy centers? Because I would have thought it was about the subtle realms of the individual body. Yeah, I, th I think um, the the points you guys just said is probably why I find it a little bit confusing because it's probably like a lack of upper right evidence and stuff like this for the, the chakra system. I guess in my mind, I was kind of thinking of that. For example, like 
um, if you look at the brain, there's sort of like a Russian doll, like concentric circle kind of thing to extent that's like mapped onto some of the chakras Like you have a primitive brain. Um, then you have like the limbic system, which is kind of emotional and all this kind of stuff. And, um, I'm not gonna, I don't know if I remember all the upper right stuff with it, but it's sort of like, you can see these like layers of the brain or you can see, um, I guess sometimes I think of the spiral, uh, spiral dynamics. I tend to think of following quite well in the chakras. Um, so there are like, I don't think I'm doing a great job of explaining it, but I sort of like see some upper right correlates to it. And then the fact that it's a system makes me think that it's more than just uh, makes me put it in the lower right. For example, you could say that the human body is an upper right thing because it's like a singular. But then you have all these individual parts that interact as a system. Um, you know, you have all these various organs, you have the nervous system, you have all this kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know if that answers the, the question. I think we got uh, muddled up a little bit because we used chakra system. The word, word system uh, has induced us to think that's on the lower right. So maybe this created the confusion. And I don't know, maybe we, we go to some other uh, example of the lower right. <laughs> Instead of talking about the chakras because that was not the topic. Family system is is a uh, is lower right, I would say. I guess just going back to the kind of definition of system a little bit, I would have thought that the lower right, because that's really my 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 um, confusion as well. That's the last uh, quadrant that I'm really not focused on in my life so much, but want to be more. Um, Systems, I mean, the low right to me, what it meant was that it's a collection of interacting holons, whole parts. So when you, when you have, um, you know, like two or more holons interacting, whether that be individual people uh, or uh, organizations or, you know, you have the internet or buses and like you said, family systems where there's two or more people interacting, um, people being holons in this case. Um, internet being made of hard drives and computers uh, more than one interacting makes the internet basically you have two computers connected that's the internet um, that's how I was thinking of the lower right that it's whole on whereas chakras up up are almost like part of the one whole on that's why I would say that's not in the lower right because that's comprising our body which is one whole on I mean, made up of many sub whole ons obviously <laughs> native whole ons but yeah, maybe can we get more clarity around what the system is, maybe? Or any other thoughts? Or, hmm. So the, this is kind of why I find it confusing, because to me, you could say, I'm not, I'm good, I think the chakras probably was a bad example, because it's very like upper left. But um, the, the exact thing you were just saying, Kanga, that it's kind of like holons interacting. So to me, whenever you can see like individual parts, engaging in a system and it's sort of like i think this is where i get confused because i'm sort of like with for example the human body or in the family system like there are correlates on for example with the family like i really think of the lower left as an engagement because that's kind of how um i experience it but i think the quadrants they're very like interrelated so i think i don't know if, i don't know if everybody else experiences this but this is why i find for some reason the lower right like a little bit confusing because I can separate them more easily in some spheres and then when they're in areas there are more like like for example the family system I, I associate more with the lower left I find it a little bit more like confusing to make it like purely uh, lower right or something yeah I mean you can't separate the quadrants and just say there's just one over there existing by itself and but I do think it's helpful for me to remember the objective and and subject subjective and so a system of a family, yes, would include the, the cultural norms and the subjective values that, that, a, that a group would share. You know, the friends, you probably have some shared values. But at, when you're just looking at two people interacting and you see two people, that's a system, just the, just the objective viewpoint of it. 
or mother, father, you know, son, daughter, brother, sister, you can say that's a system, you know, but then how they're, what they develop would go into the, in, you know, behaviors. That's my understanding of it at least. So it's, it, it, you know, like when they're looking at systems theory, of course, it's not saying that there's no people involved or cultures involved or behaviors involved. It's like trying to work with, in a way, integral theory, the quadrants, all that stuff, that's a system because we can look at it. We can analyze it. You know, we can look at the lines. I don't think you can also look at lower right without looking at the lines of development and the levels of development and then seeing how it's going to impact things in that. So, Kate, you said, yeah, you see the system of the family and then the behavior. Well, the behavior is upper right, isn't it? Of every uh, person. And then the feeling of being a family, the connection, that's the lower, lower left, no? And how I feel in the f family and towards my brother, towards my mother, or what I'm uh, experiencing in the family, that's the, the upper left. But right. the, the whole thing of it together is a system that includes these parts, like you were saying, the whole arms. Mm -hmm. But it's not, you know, so it's you're differentiating the system from the individual parts. Yeah. And the system, when you talk about the family, includes all the, the previous um, ancestors and so, so on. So the, the constellation work is, is working exactly on that, you know, on the family system, extended family system. So it's working on the lower right, despite it is working with emotions and with uh, culture and so on at the same time, you know, yeah. So Ryan, you are in, in politics. Tell us a little bit about political system and how they, <laughs> how they uh, mirror in the other quadrants. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, so just cover some of the basics. So Ken Wilber says that the lower left is cultural and the lower right is social, right? So cultural is the values and, and subjective aspects of a collective that you can't see under a microscope or necessarily measure. The social is hard data that, that is indicative of the lower right. For example, crime went down by 15%, GDP is up by 4%, that's lower right hard data. And if you type, if you look at a systems map, all those loops and stuff, and you know, systems maps are very complex, it's all about causality, right? How different objects influence other objects in an economics, you know, social political system. And that also includes things, this, this is something I was always confused about too with politics and law, is that the law itself is a lower right system. The rules do exist objectively. Like if you murder someone, you go to jail for 50 years. That's an objective rule. How someone interprets the law is a lower left quadrant phenomena, but the law itself is a lower right phenomena. So, and there's a big philosophical debate about this in the legal world called positive law versus uh, natural law. And so, um, when, when you're looking at the importance of like integral lawyers or integral politicians or integral Supreme Court people, that's very important because how the law is interpreted does depend on your subjective interior. So really quickly, I mean, just to, I have Ken Wilber's quadrant map in front of me on Google, right? And so the lower right really is about um, the external systems that you can see in your environment. So he goes galaxies, planets, Gaia system, then he goes to you know, like groups and families, tribes, villages, early states, empires, nation states, and then the planetary. Planetary system is the one that correlates with integral consciousness. So it is, it is more of like an, what you can see in your environment. And even Jordan Pearson's saying, clean your room. Your room is a lower right quadrant thing too. So I'll stop for there. The room is the lower right, but then the actual doing the cleaning of the room <laughs> would be upper left, upper right, right? Behavior. <laughs> but I think it, one thing that can be plain, fun to think about is if your room is completely dirty and disgusting, right? So you have clothes all over the floor, the dishes are not done. I'm, I'm looking at my room right now. Um, it smells terrible, right? These are all lower right quadrant things. How would that affect your internal state? How would you feel if you lived in a crap, in like a shithole every day, a pigsty? And that, that's one way we can think about how the environment affects our interiors. I'm, 
I'm interested in what you said about the law and when you said it's an interpretation. So what is this what we're seeing now an interpretation of the law? What is an, an example you could give like uh, on the Supreme Court that's that Ruth Ginsburg would have a different than, you know, the other guy? Ooh, I'm 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 kind of blanking on examples this morning. I'm I'm just thinking about I mean there's so many um legal cases where where people will interpret the law differently you know i mean according to your political ideology anything that could be uh, interpreted in on along partisan lines right i mean that's obviously biased by people's political agenda which is why the supreme court exists as a separate entity then you know supreme court judges are not running for office right um because you don't want to contaminate objective interpretation with your political ideology or political partisanship I am. For me, it's not only political, but it uh, um, can also be religious or whatever, moral um, bias, you know, that you interpret laws in different ways. So there may be more influences also, but it's, it's really interesting. Yeah? There, there's a joke in the legal world that the, the way that the lawyer interprets, like if the sentence they're going to give someone depends on what they ate for breakfast that morning. The, the entire joke is to illuminate how subjective that can be, and if the if the judge is in a bad mood, you know. So an example that's happening here in the U.S. might be this thing about abortion. Like it's it's interesting the timing for this thing about abortion. And so I know some people were saying uh, everybody's get up in arms, like oh my gosh, you know they're going to turn back time and blah blah blah. And then some people are interpreting this legal move to be um, this is just a political move that you know they're just trying to get everybody distracted you know, while they come in right before the election. So there's like a different interpretation there of, of what's actually happening with the law, with their, what they're trying to do with the law, but it doesn't change the law itself, the interpretation. You know, you're going to go and in Texas get executed if you try to get an abortion now. So I don't know how you can interpret that any differently than really horrible but <laughs> yeah <laughs> i guess you could say yay but some whoever wrote that law would be going yay but that's pretty harsh i had a, a, a discussion yesterday about that how can we see that from an integral perspective you know when the laws are changed and people are excluded from what they what rights they had before. And there, for me, it's not only political, it's again this moral thing, this ideas, this worldviews. And as uh, integralists, we know that people with a fundamentalist worldview of preserving life at any cost, but then it's the question, whose life, you know? Um, they would, <laughs> people yesterday said they are stupid. We see it as stupid, maybe, but for them it's not stupid. You know, they have the, the values they have is they do the right thing. They have even in comparison to us, they have the advantage to know what is right and what is wrong, which we don't know anymore because we have all the time to, to evaluate, you know. It's not that I advocate that, but I just... I uh, wanted to say that the systems, as we have talked about the, the, the law now in this case, has very much to do with our level of development and also in the moral line, and not only. And uh, no, I think that's what I wanted to say so far. I, I realize I'm talking too much, but I think that I just flashed on Jeff Saltzman as you were talking, and I thought, how would Jeff Saltzman say this? I mean, I'm just putting words into his mouth, but he seems to take the inner goal view. You know, like if something like abortion comes up, he's going to present the other perspective and make it seem totally valid, you know, and then he'll present the other, you know, that's what he does over and over and over again. It's like sees the good in, you know, or the true but partial or whatever it is and, and illuminates those. Isn't that, that what we need to do as integralists, to see uh, <clears throat> the people's perspective and not dismiss it automatically because we know it better? Maybe even if we do, but that is what we talked another time, that 
often integralists are seen as arrogant because they know it better, which probably they do, probably, no, I'm not sure completely, <laughs> but, uh, but as soon as we dismiss other people as stupid or lower, less developed and things, then we have a, have a problem. We create a problem no? because we don't accept them. We don't see them. We don't. And then they get as psycholo psychologically, they get offended, hurt, and they get even more like, mm -hmm. you know, so. But this is actually not the topic of today, but I'm fine if we talk about that, so. Just if we could play with that idea a bit. Um, you know, I, I was uh, studying anthropology at uni at one point and um, yeah, they were, you know, they were pointing out the, the obvious fact that we can on, only ever really see another person's perspective through our own perspective. So perspective taking, which is one of the, uh, huge drivers of development is being able to take different perspectives. Um, but I never really thought about it until you just said now, Heidi, how, how can we take a less biased perspective? I guess we can take perspective of our perspective, which is objectifying the subjective. And then you can still come through your filters of perception. So you'd have to take objective <laughs> like your perspective of your perspective and then take perspective of the other person's perspective through your perspective. And you got to have this like double or triple layers of, of awareness that you're coming from. Is there like, cause that's, I'm thinking that's probably one way of, of getting more clarity and more truth coming from the pure observer, the pure witness to really, but then uh, but there is no such thing as pure witness because that's still coming through my mental filters of, of who Kinga is and my life experiences and so on. Has anyone else got any thoughts around um, taking perspective of other, um, including lower right systems um, on how can, we can do that more clearly and less with less bias? I do think that we always have a little bit of bias, but we can try to 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 be aware of it <clears throat> and to reduce it as as and by taking ever more perspectives i think the biases get less and less because you can you can hold the perspectives you don't have to decide that is right and that is wrong what i said before but you can say okay there are three things which seem to contradict but they are okay all three of them you know and somehow live with that that's for me it's it's uh, in my personal view is uh, integral um, consciousness, you know. And um, just as an example, I, I learned it by interpreting dreams. I, for many years, I wrote down the dreams and then I did the interpretation. And I thought, I can think this means that. I can also think it means that or that. And at the end, I said, okay, probably it means all of that. And so, you know, I didn't need to decide, but kept the possibility open that it means this lot of things, maybe at the same time, maybe not, you know, that I don't need to know everything 100% and hold the perspectives at the same time. I, I think a good place to start with in interpreting, <clears throat> and this is something to me that's very important when analyzing political events, is to really make sure that all of the quadrants are taken in, into consideration when interpreting something. And also to highlight the importance of the lower right to really understand, and this is where I kind of disagree with Salzman on some things, the importance of things like money, power, and, and the system and laws that influence decisions. Because if you only interpret things culturally, let's take the Alabama law that you were mentioning, Kate. If we look at it from a solely spiral perspective, we can say, oh, this is just pure blue or amber traditionalists in the deep south having, you know, uh, enforcing their value system into law by banning abortion outright. It's just a straight up blue cultural Christian conservative Bible Belt thing. But you also said another interpretation was that this is actually a strategic kind of Machiavellian political move to position themselves and distract. So that's a more like cynical interpretation, in which case that would be more of like an orange kind of calculating, machinating house of cards kind of a political power move of combined with like red. I think both the interpretations are very important. And I think what kind of bothers me about Salzman and some integral people is they lean too much on lower left quadrant. Oh, it's just like traditionalists doing their thing. And they ignore the role of 
power and, and money and, and these kind of things. And then you have people on the left, like Noam Chomsky, who is too extreme in the lower right. Like to him, everything is just about power and corruption, money. Like why did the U.S. invade Iraq? Is it, and Wilbur said we invaded Iraq in 2003 because blue, the patriotic American exceptionalism must crush Saddam Hussein's red dictatorial dic, you know, regime. But then when you look at the role of Dick Cheney and Halliburton and Donald Rumsfeld and all of the money and corruption, we're building roads there and getting countries in debt. There is a very strong lower right quadrant influence that's also motivated by its own stages of development, like, like orange, like a very pathological set of orange. So it's good to take both into consideration. And not, and not to forget the upper left and upper right too. You know, I, I wasn't particularly talking about Jeff saying, oh, those are um, all blue meme. I was talking about him on, when he does more of an empathic move, like saying, for example, in Alabama, people are scared and they really just value life. And we all must, we all value life, right? It's more of like an NVC move or something. You know, it was it's sort of connecting the sameness in, in that we all share that. You know, does that make sense? But not not going. Oh, somebody's blue. Somebody. I I, I don't I, I don't hear him doing that too much. So call somebody blue and call somebody orange. You know, because that I don't think that's an integral move to call someone blue, actually, or orange. I mean, I, I think it's interesting analysis. What you just said is it seems spot on. But it, it I don't know if that's integral thinking. Actually, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. Isn't that a different to call somebody blue or orange or uh, to say that what they are doing or what they are saying is, uh, comes out of a mindset of orange and blue? Then you don't identify them with something, but only the, the actions, let's say, uh, belong to a certain worldview. Isn't that better? Yeah, or just, just like traditional values. Well, traditional values include some things that we all can agree with are okay to have. Mm -hmm. you know, like Jordan Peterson, clean your room, or you know, that sort of thing. It seems like it's just sort of inspiring the traditional values. You know, that are, they're not, traditional values doesn't mean it's bad. You know, it's sort mm -hmm. of the transcendent include the best parts. But I have to confess that for a long time, I really believed into sort of the, the spiral going up and up and uh, higher is better, you know, and I'm getting a little bit, uh, also thanks to Jeremy, a little bit more <laughs> cautious in that. So, uh, I, was, I was just listening to Cosmic Consciousness, that really old set, you know, today, and Ken was saying evolution doesn't mean things get better. It just means they get more complex. There's going to be more illness. There's going to be more capacity for crazy. He was talking about how serial killers have emerged who have a high level of cognition. And, you know, I was talking about all kinds of things that, you know, could be an environmental collapse, all kinds of things that are occurring because of evolution. You know, so evolution doesn't mean it's all going to utopia. And that's why people try to stay where they are and where they feel safe, you know, because they know that's, Maybe not better. Anyway. Yeah, Kate, I, I, I understand what you're saying about um, Jeff Salzman's kind of empathic move, but I, I didn't, I didn't hear um, what Salzman was. I didn't hear that talk that he or you know that episode where he talked about this, but from from what I heard from you, it doesn't sound like he included lower right quadrant in his analysis, did he? Oh, I wasn't saying he even did this. I was just saying it, it reminded me of the, what I see him do a lot with different issues that come up. Yeah, I, I don't think, he, I don't know. I haven't been watching it recently. Maybe he probably will cover this one and then we'll see what he says. As that point, I would like to, to do as an exercise again, this thing with clean your room and get it to the different uh, quadrants. <clears throat> so you said, Kate, the room is a system. It's the system of your order or disorder or whatever. So it would be the, the room itself is the lower right. 
How do the we? Mess, the mess in the room. The whole the, mess in the room. Yeah. Okay, the mess in the room is the whole, lower right. So, uh, why is the mess in the room? Because of the upper left or of the lower left or just try to get it get it through and let's see. <laughs> the upper left, maybe you're too too tired or too you know you're feeling confused or depressed, and you then upper right, you just don't bother to clean. You know, you, you just decide to sleep instead of get up and clean your room. Or you don't have a system of order, so we system would be on the right, lower right. We, you don't understand systems, so you can cannot develop a system. That's a, that's a question I had, like I've been rolling it around in my head, I find it confusing. Like, Kate, you said that integral itself is a system, which I, or, or is maybe a lower right thing, which I agree with. Um, but I also find it like confusing because of the fact that it touches on the other ones. Like, I, how do you were talking about like bring it back home? And um, I often think of, I have a sort of store day where I'm organized. Like I, I have a set bunch of stuff that I do that kind of crosses over into the different quadrants. Like one of the things I actually do is to remind myself to think of my, the way I run my store in the four quadrants. And I'm like, is that a lower right practice? Or am I confused? Like, is it, is it something else? And um, yeah, it just, it just uh, confuses me, the, the lower right thing, like really trying to find it. Like what makes, I was thinking the thing that makes, for example, a room a lower right problem as opposed to like a book that's out of place is the fact that presumably in the room there's more than one thing. Like there's a bunch of stuff. It's the sort of plural way that they're connected um, but I find myself constantly bouncing between between the different quadrants around the low right. I sort of find it fun. I don't know if other people agree, but where it sort of seems like some of the conversations kind of bounce quite a lot into the other quadrants, sort of straight from lower right. Yeah, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, Paul. It's it's almost like the more you start to describe it, the more it's starting to sound like a, a Zen cone, like the, the idea that, you know, what's uh, what's the sound of one hand clapping or if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to hear it, no, no objective other to witness it, it doesn't really make a sound. It starts to become really absurd. But I, I, I'm going back to what Kate said is pointing out the obvious of the definition of the lower right, which I, I keep now coming back to reminding myself is the, Objective collective, objective like when they, whenever there's two or more bits of stuff interacting or influencing each other or doing something loving or irritating or whatever. Um, when there's two or more bits, that's the objective collective. Yeah, so I like those two words going back to Ken Wilber's original. I mean, if you want, we could unpack Paul's store example. What's the lower right, the upper left, the upper, you know, your store has products and has uh, some sort of structure and it's a bunch of stuff and your system is to engage in commerce with that stuff and that would be the system, right? Yeah, that's right. For example, I have a practice where I try to cover the four quadrants while I'm doing it. Like I, I know for a fact that I bias upper left. Like if my sales go down, I tend to think, oh, I'm not being creative enough and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's been a practice to try to, to think of it. Like I think of upper right as like um, stuff I'm doing, like products I'm making, like money. Um, the actual, like, for example, like my store itself, like the, the sort of, even though it's not physical, the sort of physical store of it. Um, and then like lower left might be like marketing or culture or like sort of collective creativity. And then I think of the lower right, it's sort of like tricky. Like one of the things I've been playing with is automation, which I guess has to be um, lower right. And I guess kind of like organizing these things like there's part of me that thinks that being really productive is upper right and the other times I think it's really lower right, lower right because it's a system of like how can I milk what I'm making um, or 
uh, like taking taking a part in the upper right and trying to think how do I make this into a relationship somewhere else for example uh, if I make a product like recently I've been trying to make these um, fins for mermaids so instead of making one I think how can I ramp out like an entire bunch and have a system behind it so I can end up churning out more um, <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. I always find really, as you say, uh, kind of like the the sort of Zen Kevin thing. Like I, I constantly get feel myself get spaced out and confused again um, around the the lower right. I, I don't know why that is. Well, it sounds like here, you know, because I run a business too. So it's a nonprofit, but it's a business, and so the system stuff would be. I have employee, an employee manual. People can read the employee manual. It, it contains values, it contains our values, but it's an actual manual, so it's kind of like the rules. Then I have like a task management systems that people have to put their tasks up on and check them off, you know, and let everybody else know. I use Slack, you know, but that's, that's, a, that's a, something where we're engaging with each other, but that's the system that we use to engage with each other and relate to each other, and et cetera, et cetera, you know. There's the payroll. There's a system. You know, I have the bookkeeper. You know, that's a system. But then, then there's ways that we interact, you know, with each other around the system. Does that make sense? That that would be lower right, Paul? But also quickly, just the way we interact is also a system. Our individual behavior is, uh, you know, upper upper right but the way we interact and the way those behaviors influence each other that's also a system because it's objective collectives coming together doing stuff no would that mean that when uh, you talk to me and i always get angry uh, that that is the system of our interaction that's a system dynamic i think ah not it's not the system itself but it's how it is expressed I mean, it, it's a system. Yeah, if it's always, you know, that yeah. being dynamic, then that would be in family systems dynamic, that would be create a system dynamic of interaction. But it's also that gets all messy with like, upper, you know, it gets messy here. That's yeah, be yeah. right there. But that's exactly what, what I felt so for such a long time. You, you think when you see, read the Ken Wilber, you think it's really clear, no? And then you come to this moment and think, oh, <laughs> maybe not so clear. I wonder if there's some of it, and yeah, that, that did help, Kate. Like some of it is that there are systems in uh, like the lower left, or there are maybe systems in in other ways, like there's a way I think of the lower right as kind of systems and stuff, but trying to keep it puritanically to uh, the the objective side of it. Like Heidi, when you mentioned anger and stuff, I was thinking, surely that's a lower left slash upper left experiential thing as opposed to like maybe an upper right or lower right expression of that would be, how does the family objectively like act? Like can they, um, maybe dysfunctional in the sense that nobody's getting anything done or nobody's getting a job or the family income and all this kind of stuff. I think when I'm angry, then for me, it's the upper left. But when I respond with anger to situations and people everybody can observe that I'm angry, so it's objectively true, seen from the outside, then it doesn't belong, and from this point of view, from this perspective, doesn't belong to upper left. When it's about me, then it belongs on upper left, but not on the communication. It's really tricky. Yeah, because I, I would say anger is not really an objective uh, thing. Like if you were if you were clenching your fists and beating stuff and shouting, like that would be more of a uh, like I, I I tend to think of anger as a as an experiential inner experience. This is where I like I find it tricky trying to be like oh is this inner is this outer? Yeah, for me it's it's upper left. It's an inner experience. But if you see me from ten meters distance that I'm you know. Then it's you seeing somebody who is angry. That's from outside. 
you know. That's like upper right. Yeah. So I think that's lower left because I might like say I'm a say I'm a sociopath or a psychopath. Like I might not be able to interpret that you're angry. Um, if you took any emotion that somebody's expressing, I might I might not be able to interpret it that way. But I'd be able to see like oh she's moving her arms around. I think interpret you know interpretation. Oh boy, we'll get Ryan. You must have something kind of view on this. Why, why me, Kate? <laughs> um, well, I, I think it's important to remember, as Wilbur says, right, the quadrants are really perspectives, right? So every holon has four quadrants. So, so even if something that, which appears to be completely, low, let's say, completely lower right, like economics, we, we think economics, oh, lower right, and it fundamentally is, but economics still includes all four quadrants, right? It includes consumer confidence in the lower left quadrant and, you know, as uh, John Maynard Keynes called your animal spirits, it includes individual behavior in the upper right. It includes upper left, um, just like behavior, um, behavioral economics, where it's kind of like the psychology of decision making, that's the upper left. So like everything has the four perspectives. And so when we're talking about things like, you know, is, is I think certain things like emotions are fundamentally upper left, right? But if you take a upper right perspective, you can say, oh, Heidi is angry, and we can objectively see that her behavior of yelling, her face is turning red, her arms are flailing, her cortisol levels have gone up, you know, stress hormones have been released in her bloodstream, et cetera, right? You can look at the lower left cultural, you know, the aspects of how her anger is affecting other people subjectively. So, so everything has the four quadrants. Um, I think this is helpful to remember that. And I think that's exactly the point of the confusion which we have. We think we need to have one thing is lower right and the other thing is upper left, <laughs> you know, and instead of seeing that one thing has all the things, we try to separate, you know. And I think in an ideal world, is one in which all of the quadrants are taken into consideration. You know, I remember when I was, you know, this is a personal story. When I was 17, I was reading Wilbur and meditating eight hours a day and had kind of a bipolar breakdown. Uh, well, I guess that's what happens if you're 17 and reading Wilbur and meditating eight hours a day. And I went to a psychiatrist who was ostensibly a spiritual or alternative kind of psychiatrist. And I was diagnosed with bipolar and given medications and everything was reduced to upper right quadrant. My parents were telling me that there's some, I was born with a condition where something is wrong with my brain and that my brain chemicals were out of whack, which was all objectively true in terms of being measurable. I was put on drugs and felt pretty bad for about six months. And all of my interiors were ignored. And, um, but in my heart and soul, I knew that I, I could get through this. So I went cold turkey off of the medication, just meditated my way, white knuckled my way through it. And, that, and I was fine about a year. So I, I think that, and then, you know, that situation would have been handled better by the psychiatrist if my interiors and my spiritual experience and existential crisis as I, that I was experiencing was taken into consideration. And dealt with on that level concurrently, right, simultaneously with upper right and, and looking at lower right, you know, what kind of family or system or community I'm in and lower left cultural dynamics that I'm in. And if all of those are taken into consideration, you can have a lot more holistic approach to solving problems. Well, I might just jump in because this is something I'd be wanting to bring up tonight. Um, and it's kind of relating to, to that. I love the idea of, you know, looking at multiple aspects of, of the same hold on. But um, I've, been, I've been very much focused on the upper, upper hold on. I, I don't know my left my, from my right. <laughs> upper left. I am very visual. Um, um, upper left has been my, my domain most of my life. And then uh, recently... I started to see the value of uh, communities and I've always been called to, I'm, I'm a gatherer. Um, I've got a huge gatherer archetype. I'm a gatherer of information and knowledge. And I, that's why I love Ken Wilber's model because he's, he's the massive gatherer, like the ultimate gatherer and integrator. And I love gathering people too. I've done that all of my life. Um, but there's always been a very personal thing. Like I wanted to uh, bring people together just so that I can enjoy 
community. And then after having done some healing, my intention of gathering um, has come up again, but for very different reasons. Um, and this time it's not so much for my personal satisfaction of seeing these beautiful communities, but much more so um, out of almost like a passionate uh, calling for uh, creating communities because I can almost see like that's the next evolutionary step that almost developmentally wants to happen for people. We've become so individually stick when we snap back. And I think it's, it's uh, 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 hugely important also for us taking the next step um, just in terms of societal structures and systems that we exist within. Um, this all came out of uh, a question I, that we asked in a philosophy group I belong to called Socratic Cafe. And one night we were discussing the question, uh, what's one small change you can make in the world that will make the biggest difference? And for me, I think, um, you know, you could say, you know, if everyone had a loving heart and uh, if you got rid of money and all these kind of different things. Um, and for me, Brando, and for me, um, I'm thinking what I'm really called to do and the one that I can conceive of is to do with bringing people together into collectives. And if people can start to really get a sense of their power as collectives, uh, a lot of the systems that, um, that we're living within uh, that are perhaps not as effective for the environment and not sustainable. And I'm thinking big corporations and the, and the monetary systems and, and politics and the you know, puppet masters behind the chains and all that. If, if you know, we as consumers, for instance, really had a sense of our own, our collective, if that law or right was strengthened, um, then, I mean, we could recreate and change, make huge changes. Um, so that, that's something that I'm really passionate about is bringing people together for that reason, because having strong lower right systems of people together that are, you know, they need to be awakened or perhaps the system itself will serve to awaken them, which is the upper left, will is just so conducive to recreating the world that we need to recreate in such urgent ways. Um, so my calling is to, to, to create systems that bring people together that way. Can, 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 can you give an example of what, of how you how you envision doing this, or how you how you're doing this, or how you're creating these communities? Yeah, um, so I have started coaching, um, um, which last year I brought together a bunch of fabulous women here in Barcelona, and we started a coaching group uh, of of masterminds. I, I'm sure most people would have heard of masterminds. It's when yeah, a, a group of people come together to support each other. And the idea is that the whole that they form is more than some of its parts. Um, because you, you get this kind of master intelligence coming through where you, you get into this flow and you'll, you know, we're always able to see other people's shit better than our own. If I'm stuck in an area, I ask a group of five people, they'll give me five different perspectives and that then enriches my options, my life. Um, and in, in the ways that I can move forward. So my masterminds is, is a way um, that, yeah, that I can really see this coming together. But um, this is a very new concept. So I've been doing lots of brainstorming and, and throwing ideas around with people uh, to see how that can happen. But I'd love your thoughts on that, on this uh, idea of once more change, bringing collect collectives together to really co-create, um, yeah, more effective ways of living. That brings me to a topic which I have <clears throat> posted, I think, on the Integral Life platform <clears throat> in the 60s, 70s in Germany, but also I think in America, people came together in the green mindset and created communities and wanted to live together. And then <clears throat> quite um, quickly or not so quick, depended, they they bro broke off because they didn't succeed to have a right lower right um, stability, uh, lower right system of how to be together. Because only uh, being together in, um, in because we want to be together doesn't mean that we can get along and we need a sort of uh, system of rules and whatever uh, to, 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 to be able to be together. No? And that was the big delusion, I think, of the green meme who tried this experiment so uh, for me personally i would like to uh, create here something in my house with other people and the, the question is how 
how do we distill rules or, or guidelines or uh, things like that? Uh, Ryan gave me some indications and I think uh, we could talk about that. We have to reintroduce bluish rules in when we want to have integral communities no? in some way. And here we have introduced the two minute or two and a half minute uh, speaking time, which I probably have overrun. When we are a few people, is no, oh good. We are learning it. Huh? <laughs> when we are a few people, then it's also easier to, to exchange anyway. But uh, you know, that's what I'm thinking about, how to create a, a system of being together <laughs> and not only want to be together. <laughs> I was thinking a little bit of Damiano's platform as a lower right thing. I remember talking to him about this and uh, not entirely sure I understood everything he was talking about, but the basic idea of people being able to come together to collaborate on projects and share money and all this kind of stuff. And it sort of occurred to me just how much the lower right can really impact the lower left. I think of, I remember saying this at the at the time like making an integral version of the internet would be pretty impactful like if you take for example like twitter so they have this limitation that you can only do however many words that it is like 144 or whatever and it sort of lends itself to like rapid narcissism because of that because like nobody can be um can be nuanced and personally i find like twitter is like just full of even like people that I might find talking of some sense, like Jordan Peterson or whatever, like the media really cripples the the engagement. So I find like the idea of evolving the internet and also some of looking at some of the current examples is um is quite an interesting way that the that, that these system things can really uh impact us all. Especially with like technology, like some of the Silicon Valley companies have deliberately like hacked some of our primal networks like the way that we react, for example, like notifications, um, are ba they're in like basically big red because it, it signals in our brains like, oh, this is really important or this is like dangerous or something like this. And you can kind of see that the way that they've engineered the technology and how people um, find, them, find them addictive and screen culture and, and all this kind of stuff. As you say, Damiano platform, I noticed, I, I always post our recordings there, but there was nobody this week. So uh, it's not really very much uh, used as a possibility and it would be really a good possibility. I don't know, Kinga, if you have the, uh, the registration. Who um, is this Damiano? Sorry, <laughs> I don't, I'm out of the loop. Yeah, Damiano was one of our five, or is still one of our founding members, let's say, who now for about a month has obviously no time to come and he has created a startup and uh, is pro providing platform, a platform where something like Facebook, but not, not Facebook, you know, that's private and uh, our group would be a, a private group to, to be there and um, and he, his, his, his long-term goal is to have a platform for integralists where they share, uh, you can describe all your skills or your ideas or something in sort of short um, tags mm -hmm. and that you can find people with the same or same ideas, same projects or to collaborate. That is as far away uh, a version. Of, of, of idea. So far it's only us. He doesn't want to be in competition to integral life, which is not in my idea because it's a different platform, but did you post it? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Paul. So you, you can register there and come in. And I always, and also when I'm not here, Ryan, can you post then the, 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 the talks there? And on my website, I will do it later. I was thinking about that actually, like I don't know if somebody has a, a better historical sort of understanding of the evolution of integral, but like, I mean, Ryan have talked about this, like um, how 
like talking on Zoom is way different than talking on a forum. Like I kind of like the integral life forum, but it feels like so incredibly uh, dry and stuff like this. And it makes me wonder because people were, have talked a lot about integral coming together to form communities. And um, I don't know if there have been more um, big Zoom conferences than I'm aware of, but I, I have been, I haven't seen that many, but I remember the, there was this conflict, Dharma, I forget the name of it, maybe you can remember Heidi. Um, that was incredible. And it sort of made me wonder if like, some of what will help Integral to be a lot more communal is actually to some extent, some of this lower right thing of having this system, having the Zoom technology to allow people to, to get together in virtual space beyond like just text and stuff like this. Um, and maybe a little bit beyond that, like some of the VR, the sort of virtual, like the way that the internet seems to be getting like slowly more and more embodied, gets more and more visual and sensual and all this kind of stuff. Paul, we have on the list now more than 20 people, 20, 25 or something. And sometimes somebody comes, sometimes they don't have time. Somebody has been on the list that has never come. Also, they have expressed the, uh, the interest. So we don't know. It potentially, this could become a big, uh, a, a big thing. Yeah, I, I mean, big in the sense of more, reaching more people and, and uh, Oh, I don't, I cannot find English words anymore. I'm talking too much German at the moment and Italian. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I wanted to um, kind of go back to what Heidi you were saying and also what Kinga was talking about with building community because that's kind of been like kind of the, my main focus in my life right now is kind of building community and, and I think on, along similar lines to, to both of you, I'm, my thought has been like, okay, we have these Zoom calls, we have like twice a week or whatever, it's been, it's been great. Um, what, what's the next step to kind of take it to the next level? You know? And like, for example, the Marilyn Hamilton, who's a, who writes about integral cities, right? I mean, she's like starting some kind of integral city in like Canada or something, so like the world's first integral city. And then I was thinking it would be cool to have like an integral community, like what you're talking about, Heidi, in an integral city. And then you can make like an integral province and just keep on like branching out in increasing concentric circles until we have an integral planet, you know? And um, I, I guess for me, I want to really like, I, I kind of wanted to go on the forum and be like, why are people not joining the calls? Like what, like what do people really want? And like, what can we provide that will really galvanize the movement by bringing people together? Like whether it's Damiano's, like, a, like another kind of lower right platform or different kind of like activities or like what kind of, ways can we increase our community connection and, and get us even closer together and I'm, I'm curious and I think the idea of like a residential community is an awesome uh, idea I'd love to brainstorm with you more about that Heidi I'm just I'm just curious like what can we do to take this to the next level if that's even what people want yeah for me it's also curious why people use so much Facebook to write long ideas, long things, and Facebook is eating it up, you know, that's sort of uh, getting lost in many ways. So for me, it's, it's useless to spend so much time and energy to, to post on Facebook, but people are there and do it, and they are attracted by it. And, and in comparison to Zoom calls, very few people, you know, so what is it? What, what is it that we we hide behind written words, I would say. <laughs> I was uh, chatting to Luke Healy, who's, um, who's I met through the Integral Communities website, and he's, I was putting out a call to Integral Christians. Um, but uh, he, um, long story short, he basically sent me this uh, great website on studies. Um, the uh, website's called How We Gather. I'll just copy and paste it here. And this is about um, a study into how people now start to gather and form these organic uh, self-organizing systems. And it's everything from, uh, you know, like um, transformative spin classes, which are, you know, like bicycle spinning, to Oprah's uh, examples of Oprah's uh, Soul Sundays and all the smaller uh, communities that are kind of uh, similar to that, but not offshoots of it. So there's a really interesting website with about four or five different studies that these people have gone in and done. 
and they talk about why it is that we gather into groups. What's the purpose of groups? Uh, and they've kind of summarized it down into um, about six or seven different um, categories and purposes of groups. And various groups fulfill different uh, purposes of these. Um, and these are this community, just hanging out together. Uh, other groups uh, gather for personal transformation social transformation, purpose finding, creativity and accountability. I'm just reading the website here. Um, and so I guess the, the reason, I mean, when you say, Ryan, what's the next step? The question is why, <clears throat> why, why even gather into groups? What's the purpose of groups? And I think different groups and different individuals have different, um, you know, a whole variety of different reasons for gathering uh, in terms of looking at the upper left quadrant, <laughs> uh, I'm thinking, you know, how does a group fill your personal needs, uh, whether that be physical, like housing, Heidi, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that you wanted to, you know, have an intentional community living together, which is fabulous. And I, I really hope that I can come and visit you one day in Italy for that. Uh, so why do we gather, I think, is, is more essential. It's not what's the next step, because I think in that, you know, how does that say, is it like the, the purpose, uh, the the, determines the function or the, the form is determined by the function. The function of the group, the why is more essential to me. And then the how we gather, the, the, the form that that takes is, is kind of secondary. What are your thoughts around that? I do think that you need a purpose and not just hang around together. Uh, because this is sort of boring at the long run. Uh, you need to have something to collaborate or to, and even if it's only, only think tank, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you have to work by hand or something, but you need to have, uh, to have some, some common starting point. And in this case, I would love to have integral people. So far, I haven't found them yet. I have now people here with whom I, uh, we are experimenting a collaboration in some way and that so far it's good and uh, interesting also, but they are not integral people. So for me, the ideal thing would be integral consciousness and from there uh, go and, and, and allow to develop something which we don't know yet what it what it will be you know and also figure out the upper left quadrant triggers and stuff and and uh, resolve them together having the uh, sufficient consciousness about these things and that we don't blow up things and find a civil way to to work on that and i think i hope with integral people would be easier than <laughs> with others I've also been wondering about, <clears throat> I mean, for me, I was thinking about why, why do I do these meetings? And the, the real answer is because it, it brings me a lot of joy and it's just fun to, to have people come together. Even if I don't speak, even if I'm just taking the time the whole time, it's still a joy to watch people enjoying each other and, and enjoying the community. And um, although it's nice, to, it's nice to participate too once in a while, but um, something really big for me would be like community service and like having like, I, I really like community service and the idea of like integral people or just anyone in general really coming together just to try to help the community or help the world, you know, make the world a better place. And, you know, if I, I don't know if Kate, if you're a nonprofit that takes volunteers or whatever, but I would probably be volunteering with you if I lived, you know, where you live. Um, and, and something that would really excite me about some kind of is, is some kind of a collective project. Paul and I talk about this all the time. And Paul, you could probably say more about this after I'm done, but just coming together to do some kind of collaborative project in which we really feel like we're making an impact in the world. And that was part of the idea of Crossfire was it was a way to model to the world how to have a healthy, civil, compassionate debate, right? And, and so it would only be for our own enrichment. It has a larger purpose beyond us um, that you know, our coming together as integral people ripples out into the larger society. So I don't know what that'll look like specifically, but if we could collaborate on some kind of, some kind of project or something, so I don't know what it would be. That, my idea was always the political party, <laughs> but um, something where we could you know, be force multipliers for each other. Well, you know, I've been building communities for probably 25 years and our organization has actually started as a network to build com uh, communities around prison work. 
and we've had various configurations on different uh, platforms, Ning and, you know, back in the day, the well and all these kind of uh, Zods and way back, you know, there were these kind of play things before Facebook, Second Life, we had a group in there. Um, we did the avatar thing for a little while and people very, some people will come together in sort of in person like that and, and have really fabulous discussions. But then, um, and now and now it's evolved, you know, to the point where we, I have another one, it's on Mighty Networks, it's the rein, reinvention of Ning and every day, like at least five or 10 people join it and they're so excited to be part of a community doing this thing together. And everyone's out doing the work on their own in parts all over the country and world. So it is this kind of loose network and then they'll come together with their questions but it's not kind of as in-depth as per se these zoom groups that we get into things you know i do run zoom groups and and people oh my gosh i'm so excited to come to the zoom group i really want to do it but then of course they don't have time to do it so i have like five or six people loyal people that come every week and they really get a lot out of the zoom group we do have this thing that i got there was a community that there's always a community developed around our year-long training you know, for example, like that Dharma in conflict. Now, a lot of people came to that and people were really engaged, but I don't think it developed any community after that. Nothing happened. I didn't particularly meet anybody. You know, people I met were like Heidi and I already met her. <laughs> you know, here we are. But it was like this thing that we do with these year long trainings. And, and what really shifted those was that we do them online. We did them online for a long time and then we changed it. We changed the model. We said, let's, I said, let's go backwards. Let's have people come together first for a week. And then they'll, do, then they'll go do the online piece and they'll do the Zoom groups. And then at the end, they'll come together in person. And that really shifted the thing. Like people now, but the, you know, the people are like, oh my gosh, we're gonna be friends for life. And, and some of them have gone off and formed their own nonprofits together and done all kinds of things, but they don't stay with the whole group after the year. Oh, for the year, it's a really tight group of people that really like work on something together, their own learn. It's about their own learning though. So they have something invested in it. And of course they paid money to do it too. So they're, they're doubly invested in it. So it, it is people, it seems like people need to, something to invest in and then they have to actually invest in it, you know, and then they'll stick with it, I think, except for people like, you know, like I'm kind of like a fanatic about intervals. So I feel like, so of course I'll go to anything, you know, <laughs> has to do with interval. So, you know, this, it's like that. So Kate, quickly, just a question to clarify. Um, did you say the people first got together for a week and then did the online thing or did the online thing and then got together for a week? Well, I mean, it was a program that they signed up and paid for first and they, they had to apply to get into. It was like a training program. And then they came for the week of training and then they did the online training. But, the, but through it, they did, then we put, and of course there's a system there lower right system that creates all the zoom groups gets the facilitator puts you know schedules the whole thing and, and sends them endless messages come to this thing like Heidi does there's a system there inbuilt you know to keep people on track and so that that you know it's not just a loose thing like some of these kind of webinar things like oh watch a webinar and you can do whatever you want well I, don't know, I never you know I, I buy them and then I never watch them you know? <laughs> so it's a great idea. I really want to watch it. And then I never do because there's no system in play. There's no lower right structure to keep, to keep the whole thing together as a group. You know, you're not put into a cohort. Somebody has to be doing all that systems work to bring it together. Yeah. I, I also like what you said about investment. I think it's important for people to feel like, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you, the, the whole investment idea of that they're, they're giving some value for something that they're getting value out of. So there's a e fair exchange there. Um, at the same time, the reason they would invest is because there's uh, something of the group would be fulfilling some of their needs, whatever it is they need or want, uh, which is upper left. So, you know, what is it that they want? What is it that they need in their life? And then build the, the community around that. And then that brings me back to what Ryan said in terms of, you know, well, like what, what kind of groups do we build for what purpose do they come together and having our own personal mission or purpose or sense of what I want, not just maybe for my life, but maybe what I want collectively, maybe the reason we would come together for a collective is to fulfill uh, our personal needs. And then out of that also um, our need to fulfill our own purpose, which is might have to do with the, the world at large. 
So I was just thinking as we were talking about what's, you know, my deeper reason for groups is um, my personal mission is kind of to be, be a catalyst and speed up and promote evolutionary development uh, and kind of jump on board with already what wants, what wants to already happen, but just be the fire because I'm very fire um, to really just speed that along and just make it happen quicker. So it's like, let's go people. Um, so I would love to create groups that, um, as Ryan said as well, let's, let's be an example of, of how people can be together in harmony in a sustainable lower right system of relationships and connection. Um, and that's, yeah, it's an experiment every time, I guess, because it depends on the individuals that come together and what their needs are, what their purpose is and how they co-create that. Because for example, you said, Ryan, you know, you're into politics. And if we were to join into a group together, um, I'm into, yeah, bringing people together full stop. So yeah, you, the, I guess the group will be co-created in that way from the inside out. I would have to say here also, I, I can see why Damiano's website is not a success because I think it's just that everybody that's per se in Integral already has something that they're really interested in and they have to give a lot of attention to it, you know, and, and just making Integral, if Integral is your passion life, that would be great. But I think that the people that are, you know, I mean, you know, I think I contribute a lot, but I've, I, I'm just too busy now to contribute a lot to that because I'm busy with my particular focus, which is transforming the criminal justice system. That's our focus. And so it's kind of like going out and, and creating the network where there's little pockets of groups all over the place that are actually doing the, doing the work. So, yeah, Ryan, if you want to get involved, I'm sure there's people there that are doing this, that are part of our network. You know, for you know, for example, and you could get involved there. So it's it's like that. But but coming to making a massive thing would require requires like what Mark Zuckerberg did. Lots and lots of money to build the to build the system, you know, that would that would take it that far. So we sort of circled around the lower right quadrant in quite a delightful way. <laughs> I really like our conversations. It's for me the same thing, all the work I'm doing. I, it's nothing paid, you know, it's all the, uh, because I like to get to know new people, new ideas, uh, because otherwise you, you know, if you don't have people around to talk with, you have to find the people to talk with. And this is a way to, to do that. And also the shows, which I'm still doing. So I'm, I'm really glad that you were here. As I said, I will still be on the crossfire on Thursday and next Sunday at this time, I will be in the train. And uh, then the, the airplane to South Africa goes and 10 o'clock in the evening, and then I will be in South Africa for the Integral African Tour, and then the Integral African Conference. And then I will tell you how that was. It will be a, a good uh, experience, I'm, I'm sure. And I'm glad that there are people who are doing all that work to, to do this, you know, to do the, um, that's the first uh, conference in Africa, then there will be one in, in Brazil, no? Uh, now and it's it's really it's really amazing that it, it, it's a lot of work and that the people are willing to do that without you know probably they don't get paid i guess <laughs> or very minimal and i'm happy to to see this develop and i think we are doing our part and i'm grateful for that so it's about nine minutes to the end and we can do a, a little check out Well, uh, I'll just start off here. Um, yeah, thank you. This was this was really nice, and I really like the turn towards community and talking about community. This is something that's been coming up for me. I was talking to Paul about this. And, um, is that I we really like to get to know people on a more personal level too. We have this integral connection, and we talk a lot about integral topics. But I don't really know any of you very well, except for Paul, because we talk all the time. But like, like, you know, and Heidi, I, we talked a little bit on my interview with you, but like, I don't, I still don't really know a lot about, like, 
like, what is your favorite dessert? You know, like, what is, what is, what's on your bucket list? Like, what are your, what are your dreams and what do you want to accomplish in your life? Or like, you know, just where, like, where did you grow up? Like, I kind of want to know people on a more personal level. And in some ways it's even more special having the integral connection and starting with that theoretical thing. And then when we do get to the more personal, to me, it's more enriching and fulfilling and for me, that's kind of one of the next steps I'd like to try to introduce or even make a new call or where it's just more like, I just want to get to know all of us on a more intimate level. And, you know, not even necessarily informed by integral theory all the time. Just like, yeah, just, just getting to know each other more. So we'll see. We'll see how that unfolds. Thank you. Yeah, I like, I like that idea, Ryan. And, you know, maybe we could do a call and you could bring your baby goats because they're so cute. <laughs> I call it evidence of third tier. Yeah. <laughs> and also, um, I'll, I'll email you about the Zoom link and et cetera, about how to carry this on while Heidi's on her adventures. This is a great call, everyone. Thank you. Um, I found this to be the most confusing call I've ever been on, which I think is a sign that, like, I feel like I'm really weak on the lower right. So even to talk about it, just inherently confuses me but I sort of feel like I kind of touched enough based on what other people were saying and also some of my own stuff to see that it's uh, really valuable and maybe some things that I was doing that, that were lower right like I was thinking about um, uh, Kanga the link you sent about knowing the purpose of why uh, people come together I was thinking about um, me and Ryan talking we had like lots of conversations about the ways we might talk or like, oh, what do we like about this week? What do we not? And all this kind of stuff. And thinking of that to some extent in ways of like a system, um, like how, how do you practically actually form a community? And I was thinking a little bit like, like Kate, you were saying about Damiano, like part of the reason why it might not work is because people have their own passions and all this kind of stuff. Um, like there's, there's a certain degree of irony that, the person that's been around least is Damiano because he's off <laughs> doing his business and all this kind of stuff. But like, um, I, I, I sort of see a window in that of like, it's interesting to me why a community does and doesn't work. Like uh, Kate, you were saying about like this consistent course thing that would like run for a, a year or whatever. Um, like when I was on the, the Dharma conflict call, like I thought that call was full of like really, really passionate people. Like there seemed, in my experience, to be this real hunger for people to to come together, and there was a lot of really powerful conversations. So then my mind goes to like, so why does it? Why is it a one-off? Like, why is why can't people seem to self-organize? And I think some of that probably has to do with some some lower right um, stuff, like maybe just consistency, or um, I don't know, just just meeting regularly enough, or something like this. But um, there's some there's some question around that. And I think that this conversation sort of been sort of sowed quite a few seeds in my mind about the practical ways of uh, of building community and stuff. So um, yeah, it was engaging, engaging as ever, really. Yeah, I guess there's. I'm just thinking there's there's a whole lot of things that almost seem to need to align in order for for a healthy community to thrive. And I think one of the, the, I don't know, this is just my perspective, the way I see it is that we, we don't live in a culture um, that really is, we live in a very individualistic culture. And I think we're driven by a sense of our own personal significance. I mean, you look like, you look at Facebook and, and, um, and some of the systems that we use, the low right and the reasons we use them. Um, and, and, and we have become very segregated and, and I think, uh, we're a lot more vulnerable because of that. And we've created systems that are not sustainable um, for this planet or our own lives or our own well-being. And so coming together in a collective, I think, has to be with, uh, if we are to come together sustainably and in a lasting community, that has to be, again, tied back to our own, um, our own sense of uh, purpose and mission. Like there's a reason. It has to be for a reason now. Whereas, I mean, you know, in the past, if you look at the Native Americans who it's, it's a peoples that I've uh, really admired in terms of the way that the Six Nations 
uh, around the New York and what is now known as the New York area have come together and overcome their differences because uh, you know in the beginning they were killing each other. Um, I can't remember the name of the, that particular tribe that they formed. It was six of them. Um, and, you know, they had a prophet come from the north and the prophet said, you know, that he preached love and he had gave them a vision of, of unity. So their purpose for coming together was to live a more harmonious existence where they basically stopped killing each other because they nearly genocided each other in the end. I think, uh, you know, so we need to question in our modern day, what is our reason for coming together? My reason for coming together would be to basically create, like Ryan said, an example of how we as humans can coexist in sustainable ways uh, and overcome, there's a whole lot of problems uh, to be solved from the last whole lot that we, you know, we're just about uh, hopefully coming out of. Um, and then creating the next uh, greater level and transcend to that and include all that we can. So integral, teal, all the, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yet yeah, for that community to be, um, to be, to work, I see it as having to have a cultural agreement of yes, this is what we're all aiming towards, and that has to be aligned with the individual purpose um, and needs that we're really going for. So it brings up the question: What comes first, the chicken or, or the egg? Do people need to be aware of their needs and purpose first, or can we create structures that will help them to come together and discover that, so that your purpose and your tribe are kind of born together? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Which one comes first? I would like to think that there's a system that we can create whereby people come together in certain ways that is conducive to discovering the other two that's required. And then the individual actions and behavior of showing up every week will take care of itself. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Paul, I wanted to tell you for this uh, conflict and Dharma, there was uh, some uh, invitations to webinars from Mais Kessler and I participated in one when they talked with uh, Patrick Cassidy. But it was uh, quite a bit about uh, Aikido. His community is very much uh, connected with Aikido and uh, in, they are the integral dojo. No? So, and it was nice, uh, I have to say. And then I have invited uh, um, Dominique Cassidy and I have had an interview with her, a conversation with her, which I streamed last week in the, the wisdomfactory.net. You still find it in on, on the top really and then also in conversations that matter. And I have uh, connected with some other people for an interview and uh, it might happen. So it depends also on us. Probably the, the Facebook page, I went there several times and it didn't work. I mean, there was nothing else coming on. That's, that's sort of dead, but that's what it was. And what else did I want to say? Yeah, I, I like this call because I really like to figure out these questions, which normally we don't dare to ask integral authorities, you know. Uh, is that a lower left? Is that orange? Is that green? Is that whatever, you know? And we can figure it out in a, in a very natural way without needing to be ashamed that we don't know everything right away. So I really love that for this collaboration among us. And that's what I intend to do with the Sunday calls, you know, to, to explore these things by co-create and find what I find so lovely with everybody. What One says something and that evokes in me or in you another idea and then it comes in and it seems maybe a little bit chaotic for somebody who is listening, but in our conversation, it's not chaotic at all. And so co-creation, that's the word for me. So thank you. And I see you on the Sunday course in four weeks, I guess. <laughs> okay. Just a quick question. Are we not having a call then next Sunday? or? The yeah, yeah. But Ryan or, or, or Kate, here. they will take care for that. But only I, I, I'm I, not here, you know, because normally I initiate it. And you, you need to send out the reminders, okay? Well, when Heidi's not here, we're going to have a party. We're going to be drinking beer and, and having a crazy time. <laughs> Tequila <event>. shots. <laughs> and I, I bring you, I send you a, a mosquito from there. <laughs> 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 Make it drunk. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye, -bye.